What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're going to be talking about aortic diseases. That includes aortic dissections and aortic aneurysms. Again, this is going to be a part of our clinical medicine section for those students preparing for their Step 2, their PANTS, their nurse practitioner exam. So please continue to watch this series. If you guys do like it, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, highly suggest you guys go down the description box below, click on the link to go to our website. On there, we have notes, we have illustrations, a lot of great things there. Also some merchandise and we're developing courses for your exams such as those preparing for the step two, the pants and the nurse practitioner exam. So please go check those out. All right, first things first, aortic dissection. When we talk about aortic dissection, it's actually pretty straightforward. There is a tear within the intimal layer. So you know, based upon the anatomy of a blood vessel, you have the tunica intima or the tunica interna. Then you have the tunica media and the tunica externa. There's a tear within that tunica intima or the tunica interna. When you have that intimal tear, we're gonna call it, what happens is blood can actually easily dissect, easily dissect in between the tunica intima and the tunica media. So blood will naturally go, you know, normally, it should go left ventricle, it should go into the aorta, it should move down the true lumen of the aorta. But sometimes it can rip right through this tunica intima and cause blood to kind of accumulate and propagate inside of this false lumen, if you will. So now we have blood kind of getting trapped into this little area here. And this is the problematic issue where you can kind of form this thing called a false lumen, and but you'll also have blood kind of moving down through this true lumen. And that's some of the things that you can notice in patients who develop aortic dissections is you have what's called an intimal tear. This will cause blood to rip in to what's called, it'll create a false lumen and then we will talk later why this is a problematic issue. Because these actual false lumens, what can happen is blood can continue to propagate down them and pinch off. Let's say, for example, we'll talk about this a little bit later. Let's say that there is actually a branch off of the aorta here. This is going to start kind of accumulating here, sagging where all that blood will start to accumulate and compress that branch. And now no blood flow is going to come off of that branch. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, okay? So again, Big thing to remember here is that you create these things called an intimal tear that can create a false lumen, and we'll talk about the complications of the false lumen a little bit later. All right, that's aortic dissections. With aortic dissection, we have to ask ourselves the question, what's causing this intimal tear? Why is the actual blood vessel lining ripping and causing blood to rip into this false lumen? Two reasons. One is the pressure in the aorta is just way too dang high, all right? Now, what would cause aortic pressures to be so high that literally blood could rip through the intimal lining and start accumulating in this like little space here, this false lumen space. You see how again, it's in between the tunica, the red here is the tunica intima, and this maroon is the tunica media. That's all gonna be blood sitting here in this area here. What is the reason why the aortic pressure would be too high? It's not that hard to imagine, hypertension. So chronic hypertension is by far gonna be one of the most common causes of aortic dissections. Another one would be something that's causing damage to the actual, or something that's causing breakdown of the actual vessel wall. So what do I mean here? So let's say that there's actually some type of connective tissue destruction. That would be one way that we could actually really weaken the blood vessel wall. What's diseases that cause connective tissue destruction? Vasculitis, so if you have a vasculitis, these are relatively rare, but things like syphilis and takayasus. Another one is where you not necessarily have destruction, but you have mutations where you don't form proper connective tissue. These are rare, but things like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and Marfan syndrome are also going to be particular disorders where you can notice this as well. The other thing that I would want you guys to realize is that there can be just natural kind of like just what's called proteolytic destruction here as well. And you can see this sometimes where sometimes you can have like weakness of the vessel wall where it kind of dilates. And so another potential scenario where you can see this is another disease called aneurysms, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So if you have a weak aorta or a weak vessel wall, that thing causes this vessel wall to be weak out here and it's gonna be much more easy for you to kind of pop through the intima and spill blood right in between the tunica media and the tunica intima, creating that false lumen, if you will. So again, high pressures or connective tissue destruction causing a weak aorta. All right, 
The next concept that I want you guys to understand here is when we talk about dissections, aortic dissections, there's two types. All right, so we have to be able to classify them. So we know it's usually an intimal tear creating a false lumen. We know that there is going to be potentially due to high blood pressure or connective tissue destruction. But we also have to be able to classify this based upon where it occurs. So Stanford A dissections, they have to involve the ascending aorta. They have to. So you have to have an intimal tear here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna show now all the results. Here's the intimal tear. And look how the actual dissection continues to propagate. So blood will flow, left ventricle, up here, go into the false lumen. And all this blood will kind of propagate into this kind of false lumen here. And it may continue kind of like far. But all that matters is, is that it originates, the actual dissection originates at the ascending aorta. That has to be the big defining factor is it has to involve the ascending aorta. That's it, okay? Stanford B is it doesn't have to start at the ascending aorta. It has to become, be, it has to begin beyond the left subclavian artery. So I want you to remember beyond the left subclavian artery. So it would start somewhere like right here maybe. So here I'm gonna have my intimal tear, and then I'm gonna have all that blood ripping in through that area here. So it would go left ventricle, up through the ascending aorta, aortic arch, oh, there's a little tear here, boom. And blood's gonna start creating this false lumen at this point here, okay? So it has to be after the left subclavian artery. And that is kind of how we defined these particular types of aortic dissections. Okay, so we got aortic dissection done for the most part, kind of introducing it, talking about the pathophys, the causes, and then the classification. We're gonna do the same thing with aortic aneurysms. Aortic aneurysms is just the dilation of the aortic vessel wall. So this is usually going to be some type of dilation of the aortic vessel. So you're gonna notice this as the potential cause here. So I, look, you look at this monster dilation here. And we'll talk about the degrees of dilation depending upon the location. Oftentimes, anything greater than three centimeters, usually within the abdominal aorta, is considered to be pretty, pretty large. And at least abnormally large. So we have to ask ourselves the question, we have dilation of the aortic vessels. Why is there the dilation of the aortic vessels? And it's actually a combination of what we talked about in patients who have abdominal, I'm sorry, aortic dissections. They have to have a combination of a weak aorta and usually high aortic pressures. So what happens is, in these patients, they have some type of proteolytic destruction of the smooth muscle and the connective tissue. So what we're gonna say is, is you're gonna say there's going to be vessel wall destruction. It's not just the connective tissue, it's gonna be the smooth muscle, a bunch of different tissue. What's causing this vessel wall destruction? So there's, here's gonna be this vessel wall destruction. What is causing this? It's gonna be all the things that we just mentioned. <laughs> Vasculitis would be one particular thing. Another one would be any kind of connective tissue disease. We'll put Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and we'll put Marfan syndrome. It could also be, what else? This one's interesting. For these patients, you really wanna think about smoking. Smoking is a really, really strong risk factor because it can cause proteolytic activation and lead to a lot of destruction of this tissue in the vessel wall. So smoking is a really bad one. And there's one more, and this is atherosclerosis. This may be kind of a double fold. One is it may create inflammation within the vessel wall, but it may actually knock out some of the blood vessels that supply the outer part of the vessel, like the, what's called the vasovasorum. And so this can cause a lot of destruction of the vessel wall. So now the vessel wall is weak because of this vessel wall destruction. All of a sudden, you decide to increase, so we're gonna have increased vessel wall destruction, and then on top of that, you're going to increase the aortic pressure. What diseases do this? Hypertension. So if I have a patient who has hypertension, they're going to cause the pressure that's being exerted on this weak vessel wall to increase, and what do you think is gonna happen? It's gonna cause vessel dilation. So you're gonna have a weak vessel wall that will then progress to become a dilated, this will cause 
an excessive dilation of the aortic vessel. So this will precipitate as dilation of the aortic vessel. So oftentimes what you want to think about in a patient who has aortic aneurysms is look for smoking atherosclerosis. These happen to be, for the most part, very common and very common in combination with having a very high blood pressure. Aortic dissections, you're gonna notice that high blood pressure is gonna be by far the most common cause, but it could be connective tissue destruction. All right, aortic aneurysms, we know it's a dilation of the vessel, we know it's because of vessel wall destruction in combination with high BP. That's leading to the dilation of the aortic vessel. But we have to define aortic aneurysms in the same way that we define aortic dissections. So there's what's called thoracic aortic aneurysms, or we're gonna abbreviate TAA, and abdominal aortic aneurysms, or which we'll abbreviate AAA, okay? Now, with TAA, you have to have dilation, which we're gonna mark here with this blue kind of like arrow here. This is going to be the vessel wall dilation. For the AAA, this is gonna be the vessel wall dilation. Really, the, pro the actual determination of where it's a thoracic aortic aneurysm versus abdominal is very straightforward. Where is it with respect to the diaphragm? Thoracic aortic, above the diaphragm. Abdominal aortic, below the diaphragm. But it's more particular than that. And so what we have to say is usually with thoracic aortic aneurysms, they most commonly involve ascending aorta. Because there's a lot of space between the ascending aorta all the way to the diaphragm. Where is it most common? It's usually the ascending aorta. Same situation. An aortic aneurysm in the abdomen can form anywhere from below the diaphragm down but where is it most common? It's most common to involve just below the kidneys. And we call that the infrarenal. So it most commonly involves the infrarenal aorta. So oftentimes we call this an infrarenal abdominal aortic aneurysm. All right, so at this point, we now understand what is an aortic dissection, what is an aortic aneurysm, what is the pathophysiology behind them, what's the causes, and then we understand some of the classifications. Now what I wanna do is, we have a patient who has an aortic dissection, what are the complications? We have a patient with an aortic aneurysm, what are the complications? All right, my friends, on to the complications, things that you can see in patients who have aortic diseases such as dissections and aneurysms. So when a patient comes in who has an aortic dissection, oftentimes the classic finding, like you look for this in your boards, is that ripping, tearing chest pain. That's honestly the classic sign of an aortic dissection. That's really the thing that you're, you should already know, it should be ingrained into your brain. Ripping, tearing chest pain. I don't even have to write that up, you should know that for aortic dissections. What you can see is aortic dissections, as they continue to propagate along that false lumen, you see a lot of scary complications associated with this that'll also cue you up on your clinical vignette. One of those is shock. And this can happen in two ways. One is, let's say that blood is traveling through the left ventricle into the aorta, it's moving through the true lumen. Oh, there's an intimal tear, why? Because of high blood pressure, right? High aortic pressure, or because of a weak vessel wall from connective tissue destruction. And from there, it just rips right in there and creates this false lumen. And then what can happen is blood can kind of settle in this area, but what else could it do? If it's possible enough, it could rip right out of the vessel. So blood that's running through this high pressure system could spill right out of your vascular system. This will quickly lead to blood loss. And if you lose blood, what do you think is gonna happen to the patient's blood pressure? It is going to become very low and they can progress to where the actual blood pressure is so low that multiple organ systems start becoming dysfunctional and this patient starts requiring vasopressor support. This is a very specific type of shock, which we call hypovolemic shock, but it's more of a hypovolemic shock from blood loss. So sometimes you may also hear the term um, hemorrhagic shock. It's just the type of hypovolemic. So one of the scary complications associated with aortic dissections is it rips through and causes what we refer to as a rupture, if you will. So if this puppy ruptures, then you can start seeing blood loss. The other one, this is actually really interesting. If you guys remember from the pericardial disease lecture and cardiac tamponade, one of the causes of cardiac tamponade is hemopericardium. So if blood moves from the left ventricle through the aorta and here at the ascending aorta, it rips right through the intima, and then from there, it rips right through the wall into the pericardial sac. 
Now this patient can start developing what? Blood that can accumulate directly into their pericardium. What is this called? A hemopericardium. This hemopericardium is terrifying because if it accumulates rapidly enough blood, it will then cause the patient to develop what's called cardiac tamponade. And if that pressure rises up, it compresses the actual heart and prevents it from filling, which can progress to shock. Except this type of shock is not a hypovolemic shock. This type of shock is usually what we refer to as a obstructive shock. So we call this obstructive shock. So you can see two different types of shock potentially based upon the complications that can arise from an aortic dissection. All right, so the next component here is if we come down here, we're gonna have malperfusion syndromes. So what do I mean here? Well, remember I told you that as blood leaves the left ventricle and it rips out of the left ventricle and it goes into the aorta, let's say that it rips right here, right into the actual ascending aorta, it rips right through the intima. The blood starts kind of sitting and creating what, this kind of problem within the false lumen here. Now what happens is, is if this blood kind of accumulates here, it can really start to even retrogradely work backwards and then start to compress the aortic valve. If it compresses the aortic valve, it can lead to aortic valve dysfunction. So what you may see here is you may see what's called aortic valve damage, which then, then can lead to acute aortic regurgitation, which can lead to acute CHF, acute heart failure. This is the problem because if you damage the aortic valve, now blood can easily just rip right back in. Right, and so that's the problem here is now we have blood that rips right into this area, creates a false lumen, compresses the aortic valve, and now blood can easily pop back into the left ventricle and cause a QCHF. Okay, the next concept here is that if blood does move from the left ventricle into the aorta, and then from here it goes into this ascending part here, the ascending aorta where there's a dissection, now blood can actually track into this in the same way that it tracked into this causing aortic regurgitation. It can track in and cause blood to settle here where it starts to compress or narrow the coronary artery. And if I develop coronary artery compression, then I'm going to lead to a myocardial ischemia or myocardial infarction. So look at that, you're compressing the coronary vessels and this can lead to an MI. So, so far from the malperfusions, ripped in, damaged the valve. Ripped in, narrowed the coronary artery. What if it rips in here, same thing, runs from the left ventricle into the aorta, rips here, and then it starts to compress here at the brachiocephalic. Well now, it's gonna be really hard to get blood out into the right subclavian artery, and it'll be easy to get blood into the left subclavian artery. So that means that the pressure on this side will be normal, but the pressure and pulse on this side will be lower. And so what you'll notice out of this scenario for these patients is you will notice a decrease in the systolic blood pressure and a decrease in the pulse. So you'll notice asymmetric blood pressures. Generally, we say that this should at least be greater than a 20 millimeter mercury difference. 20 millimeter mercury difference. Here, it'll be low. So here you'll have decreased flow, and here you'll have normal flow. So here you'll have normal blood flow. Here you'll have decreased flow. And the reason why you'll have decreased flow is because this is actually being narrowed because as the blood rips through this part, it creates this like false lumen which narrows the brachiocephalic trunk. Okay, so noticing asymmetric blood pressures and asymmetrically decreased pulses in a patient with ripping, tearing chest pain is classic for aortic dissection. I don't want you to forget this one. With that being said, we're kind of working our way up, right? So we started with the ascending aorta, then we're up to the brachiocephalic trunk. What's the next part? It's the carotids. So what if the blood goes from the left ventricle into the ascending aorta, passes the brachiocephalic, but then rips right here 
and starts compressing and narrowing the carotids. If you narrow the carotids, now you're going to reduce the blood flow to the cerebrum. And if you reduce the blood flow to the cerebrum, you can lead to a TIA. Worst case scenario, you cause a stroke, like a CVA. The other thing is it can compress what's called your sympathetic plexus. And if it compresses, so here you have what's called your sympathetic plexus. If that puppy gets compressed, what it'll do is it'll decrease the actual function of that sympathetic nerve. And it'll lead to something which we call Horner's syndrome. Now, you have compression here. This leads to Horner's syndrome. That begs the question, what are the classic features of Horner syndrome? One is ptosis. So the eyelid will kind of droop. The other one is meiosis. The pupil on that same side will be constricted. And anhydrosis. You won't sweat on that side of the actual forehead. So when we have ascending aortic uh, dissection, you can have aortic regurgitation, coronary artery compression with MI. Brachiocephalic compression, you develop asymmetric blood pressures and pulses. Carotid, uh, common carotid artery compression, you can develop TIA, CVA because you don't perfuse the brain, or you can compress the sympathetic plexus causing Horner syndrome. Now we're gonna keep going down into the descending aortic dissection. So now we're getting into these parts, where now blood is actually past the entire aortic arch, it's moving down, and what it does is it dissects through a part here, blood starts accumulating here in this false lumen and compresses the renal artery. Now you're getting very little blood flow to the kidney. And if you get very reduced, core, uh, reduced uh, renal perfusion, what can that lead to? An acute kidney injury. And so you'll see these patients maybe having an increase in their creatinine, a decrease in their urine output. The other thing is if it continues, maybe it's running down here and then it dissects into this one, it dissects through the actual descending aorta here, blood pools up in this false lumen and compresses here, maybe this is an inferior mesenteric artery or a superior mesenteric artery supplying the bowel. Now the bowel is going to get reduced perfusion. And if you get reduced perfusion to the bowel, this can lead to bowel ischemia. So you'll wanna watch out for things like bowel ischemia. And usually the big one is gonna be acute mesenteric ischemia. All right? So that was kind of in the descending aorta. Now let's come all the way down to the distal aorta. So we started ascending, aortic arch, descending aorta, and then all the way at the distal aorta. Blood's kind of flowing down the distal aorta. It hasn't ripped through an intima, but here it gets to this part here, right at like the bifurcation. And whoop, what does it do? It rips in here. And sometimes you can have the same thing. Let's say it happens on both sides here. Here you have another scenario where again, same kind of concept happened. Blood kind of rips through here and accumulates in these false lumens. Blood starts settling here. If blood starts settling here, what can happen is it can really narrow this lumen and it can make it almost impossible for blood flow to go to the distal extremities. And these patients may develop something called an acute limb ischemia. And sometimes what you can see with this is they can develop something called Lerich syndrome, where they have decreased pulses in the lower extremities, they have erectile dysfunction and hip and buttock pain. And this is something that's very, very terrifying. If you have a patient with a cold leg, very decreased pulses, they have less pain or they have intense pain, then you wanna start thinking about an acute limb ischemia from potentially an aortic dissection in the differential. All right, so with aortic dissections, we have covered the classic finding is usually that ripping, tearing chest pain, but we covered the most terrifying complications, which is shock, and then the ones that you really wanna watch out for here on your boards, the malperfusion syndrome, from the dissection creating a false lumen and knocking the blood flow or narrowing the actual blood vessels off that branch off of that aorta. And we've talked about these here. We come with the aortic aneurysm. With aortic aneurysms, again, it's that vessel dilation, if you will. When that puppy dilates, man, it's a thin wall. It's already been destroyed. The, the actual vessel wall is super weak. That's why it's dilated. Pressure shoots up, and when it does shoot up, these can literally cause them to pop. When this happens, these patients can literally cause, so if it ruptures, you will have these patients with a massive blood loss.
and they will exsanguinate. And when they have this massive blood loss, they will drop their pressure and develop shock, right? Usually hypovolemic or that subtype, which we call it hemorrhagic shock. Now, one of the other things that you want to be able to pick up so when if the patient comes in shocky, their blood pressure is really, really low, they're requiring vasopressor support or fluid support or whatever it may be, one of the things that usually is a telltale sign to help you on your exam is that whenever this ruptures, it usually produces like a sentinel sign. So usually, like if you ever heard the term that subarachnoid hemorrhage is that thunderclap headache, that terrible worst headache you've ever had in your life, that's usually a sign that the vessel is ruptured. In the same way, where is the abdominal aorta? In the belly. So usually at the same time that you precipitate with this rupture, these patients may also present with back pain or belly pain. So look for back or abdomen pain. The other thing is, when this thing ruptures and how big this thing is, it may cause a pulsatile mass. So you also want to watch out for any evidence of a pulsatile a pulsatile abdominal mass. And the last thing here is sometimes as this blood starts leaking out here, we'll draw it over here. Let's say that this puppy ruptures. The abdominal aorta is usually retroperitoneal. So when blood kind of leaks into that retroperitoneal space, it'll cause this flank kind of ecchymosis sign. And so look for any evidence of like flank ecchymoses. With all of that being said, you have a patient who comes in, low blood pressure, belly back pain, pulsatile mass, and maybe flank ecchymoses, think about shock, potentially due to an aortic aneurysm that's ruptured. Now, we have a couple complications here that you can see with a thoracic aortic aneurysm. Now, thoracic aortic aneurysms, they can generally be like asymptomatic and the way that they present was with complications, right? Or they may cause mild chest pain. But some of the biggest complications associated with a thoracic aortic aneurysm is usually a thromboemboli. So think about this, you have this dilated area, that's stasis right there, my friends. If there is at any point this dilation that causes stasis of blood flow, what is stasis of blood flow going to do? Create an opportunity for a clot to form, a thrombus. That thrombus will then break pieces off, and these are called emboli, and these emboli will just float and when they go and float, where can they float to? They can float to the brain, they can float to the belly, and they can float to the legs. And they may cause a stroke, a acute mesenteric ischemia, or an acute limb ischemia. So they may have a neurodeficit, belly pain, or leg pain and decreased pulses in a cold limb. These are terrifying events. Another one here, is that, look at this, look, look at this son of a gun. This thing's so dilated, look at the space between the aortic valves. They can't even co together. And because of that, blood will easily rush back into the heart and cause aortic regurgitation. So with this, you may also see aortic regurgitation, which can cause massive amounts of blood to accumulate within the heart and very little blood to go out. So you have a low cardiac output and the heart's filled with blood. What can that lead to? acute heart failure. So watch out for acute CHF that can develop as a result of aortic regurgitation due to an ascending aortic aneurysm. All right, the last one. I'd say it's not as high yield, but it's something to think about that sometimes they can mess with you on the vignette. When this aorta is so dang big, all right, big as a mother stinker, it starts compressing on nearby structures. It'll compress on the esophagus, which is this blue tube here. It may get big enough that it compresses the esophagus. So it compresses the trachea, sorry, in the blue here, compresses the brown here, which is the esophagus, compresses the superior vena cava, and there's even nerves nearby, like the recurrent laryngeal nerve, compresses that puppy. Think about all the nasty effects. So if we come down here for a second, think about this. You compress the blue here, the superior vena cava, you can develop something called SVC syndrome. You compress the trachea. What do you think is going to happen? It's going to be hard to get air in. So sometimes these patients develop something called a strider or sometimes even a dyspnea. You're compressing the esophagus. And that can lead to something we refer to as uh, dysphagia. And lastly, you may even compress like the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So the recurrent laryngeal nerve, we're going to put RLN, can be compressed. And this may lead to like a hoarseness.
of the voice. All right. So think about that because of these puppies being compressed, if you will, we'll kind of put like a little thing here. These are all being compressed. This could be some of the compressive symptoms that you may see with the thoracic aortic aneurysm. All right, on to the last one here. So AAA, obviously the most concerning signs and the most common feature is what we talked about above with shock and the kind of the abdominal pain, back pain, pulse of town, mass, et cetera. But other things that again, when you get this big dilated area, blood kind of like circulates and stays in this area a little bit more. So that's called stasis. With stasis, this creates an opportunity for a thrombus that can break off a piece and form an embolus that can then embolize via the superior mesenteric, inferior mesenteric artery, or it can embolize down the lower extremity. And this could lead to acute limb ischemia, so pain in the leg, decreased pulses, cold limb, or to the belly where it may cause acute mesenteric ischemia, belly pain, right, that's gonna be out of proportion. So these are other complications you can see with the AAA. The scary, scary one is what's called an upper GI bleed. This usually, just as a quick note, this is actually called an aorto enteric fistula. Now with this being said, it can happen with triple A's, but I'm gonna put a little note here. It's usually in patients who have triple A's that have ha recently have some type of surgery where they've had a graft that's done. And what can happen is that graft that's usually around that triple A starts fusing with the small bowel and you create a fistula, a little connection and blood that's in this high pressure aorta, pew, 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 pew right here into the small bowel you'll start peeing out blood faster than you can imagine. And so these patients will definitely develop sometimes a melena, but if it's fast enough, if it's a really brisk GI bleed, sometimes it can be pretty bright. And so sometimes you may even see what we call hemato, and we'll write this out over here. So you can have melena, but you can also have something called hematochesia. All right, and so these are some of the features that you may see, melena or hematochesia. Now that may sound kind of like, wait, I thought upper GI bleeds is always kind of gonna be melena. It definitely will most likely be melena, but if it is a very, very brisk upper GI bleed, which is what this one will be, sometimes it can be so fast it doesn't have enough time to kind of like oxidize at all, and it can cause this kind of hematochesia, this bright red kind of blood appearance. All right, so with all of this being said, a patient who comes in with an aortic disease, such as an aortic dissection, an aortic aneurysm, we know the causes, the pathophys, the classification, the complications, and the classic findings. Now, we gotta diagnose and treat these babes. We move on to the next component here. We have a patient who has an aortic dissection, or we at least suspect it. They're coming in with them ripping, tearing, chest pain, jaw, scapular pain, asymmetric blood pressures, decreased pulses, maybe decreased kind of like pulse at the lower extremities, claudication, features of acute limb ischemia, whatever it may be, I think they have an aortic dissection. What's the first thing that I need to do? Okay, what's their blood pressure? Again, the most common cause is hypertension. Do they have that tearing chest pain? Do they have asymmetric blood pressure differences? Do they have any features of mouth perfusion syndromes? If they do, get an ECG and a chest x-ray. You're getting the ECG because you don't want to miss an MI and you don't want to actually miss anything else in the chest that could be causing this chest pain. So if you do that, Chest x-ray is actually somewhat helpful for aortic dissections. If it's a really kind of wide and mediastinum, at least greater than or equal to eight centimeters, you can say for some kind of reason, there may be some type of disease within the mediastinum and guess what's involved in that? The aorta. And so you should take a, a further look if you have any of these features above. The question that comes up as to determine the next test is if they are hemodynamically unstable or not. There is also this other question of the risk of contrast-induced nephropathy. I'll let my pet peeve go aside of this one, but again, if you're going to give somebody contrast, there is the risk of kidney injury, so if they do have end-stage renal disease, you should also be very, very cautious with giving them more contrast. But that should never delay the need for a test that is life-saving, or at least identifying of a cause that could be completely killing the patient. So in this scenario, if they are hemodynamically unstable or they have a risk of contrast-induced nephropathy, what do we do? Well, if they do have this, then we probably shouldn't take the time to send them to the CT scanner because it's gonna give them contrast and there is risk of decompensation and transport. So instead, I should do a bedside transesophageal echocardiogram, and that'll help me to see if there is any false lumen and true lumen and thus an entomal flap that would be supportive of an aortic dissection. 
if they are not unstable and they don't have a risk of CIN, then I have time to go to the CT scanner and they have no risk of causing contrast-induced nephropathy. So therefore, I'm going to get the best possible test, which is a CT angiogram. And if they don't have the ability to go to a CT angiogram, you can also do MR. So it's an MRI with an angiography as well. They're both the same. And this is going to give you a really good look because it's going to give you all these different dimensions, the severity of it. And so this is a really, really good test for determining the cause or determining if they have an aortic dissection. All right. <clears throat> now, with that being said, that gives us our nice, beautiful approach to an aortic dissection. Question then comes, how do we treat it? It really depends upon the type. I told you before, Stanford A's are really dangerous because of the risk of aortic regurgitation, myocardial infarction, and cardiac tamponade and rupture. Therefore, these, yes, I will medically temporize them. So if they are hypertensive, I don't want that dissection to get worse. And so I'll control their blood pressure with different medications. Nitroprusside is the drug that will get to vasodilate and reduce their blood pressure. And then we'll try to get their heart rate a little bit lower by using beta blockers. If they are in frank shock, so hemorrhagic shock, so they have ruptured, then I will use pressors and IV fluid or blood. But the main thing for Stanford A, and if they ask you any question on the exam, what's the, the definitive treatment for Stanford A? It is always surgical intervention. Temporize them if you need to, but get them to surgery as soon as possible. And usually with this one, we're going to do a graft. So we'll take where the disease kind of dissection is, and we'll cut that out and put in this graft. The other thing that you could potentially do is if you have a Stanford B, you would medically temporize them. All right. You would treat their hypertension, treat their tachycardia. And if for whatever reason they develop scary complications. So what would be Stanford B ones? There'd be acute kidney injury, mesenteric ischemia, acute limb ischemia, rupture that would cause hemodynamic compromise. In those scenarios, you take them to surgery and you can do a graft or you can do a stent. All right. Also known as a endovascular kind of aortic repair here or an EVAR. But only if complications arise, every patient for Stanford A. So now we have a patient who comes in, we think that they have an aortic aneurysm. You want to think about something. If they have signs of aortic aneurysms, we're gonna go through that. But remember I told you for aortic aneurysms, which was the AAA the most common, right? What did I say was the most common cause? Hypertension, high cholesterol, and smoking. The other thing is advanced age. As people get older, their, their vessel actually gets super weak. You really want to be able to know when to screen a patient for triple A's because not all patients will present with any symptoms. And so you have to be able to help them out. Surveillance is key. If they are greater than 65 years old, a male with a history of smoking, they need to be screened for a triple A. And then from there, monitor it throughout. If they have those three things, male greater than 65 and smoking, you screen them. How do you do that? You get an abdominal ultrasound. What they'll do is they'll measure the abdominal aorta and see the width of it. If this puppy is less than three, they have no AAA and they don't really need any further monitoring. If it's greater than three, that's big and we can't miss that. So from there, we will take the next step and ultrasound them again in six to 12 months. But here's the big thing that you can't forget. If the size of it is greater than or equal to 5.5 centimeters or it grew greater than 0.5 centimeters in six months, these patients need to be evaluated for surgery. So you need to consult surgical service for them to get an elective surgical procedure. Okay, that's for surveilling them, making sure that you don't miss it. What about the patients who you think are actually having these things? Okay, we'll talk about that in a second, but TAA screening is a little bit less common. The only reason you would be doing this is if a patient has a bicuspid aortic valve or Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and Marfan syndrome because they are at high risk. In these scenarios, you'll get a CT angiogram and look at that and see, hey, do they have a, a, a thoracic aortic aneurysm? Hey, we can't miss this. We should probably keep track of it, see if it gets bigger, and then if need be, contact surgery. For patients who are symptomatic, so they're presenting with any of the features of the thoracic aortic aneurysm or abdominal aortic aneurysm, you have to ask the question, are they stable or not? If they are not, then you have to do something different. If they are stable, you want to do something at the bedside where that doesn't require transport. Abdominal ultrasound or a TEE is usually pretty good. And you'll be able to see here off the echo, look at this sucker. Look how huge the aortic kind of root is. That's massive. 
And then the other thing here is look at your abdominal ultrasound to see, hey, what's the size of that bad boy? And that's gonna be super helpful as well. If they are not hemodynamically unstable, then you have time. Go get a CT angiogram. Take a look here at the aorta. Oh, it doesn't look too big, but oh my gosh, there is a huge goombach here in their abdomen that's actually ruptured. So that's gonna be super helpful for being able to identify for surgical planning and to determine the actual size of the aneurysm, okay? And that would be the big things for a TAA or a AAA that is presenting with symptoms. Okay, from there, what do we do? We now gotta treat these bad boys. So with these, it's always going to be medical management, all right? Smoking cessation is gonna be really important for anybody who smokes. Statin therapy for hyperlipidemia, because again, I told you, smoking is a big risk factor, hyperlipidemia is a big risk factor, and then what do you think is the last one? Hypertension. So control their blood pressure, beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, or an ARB, but make sure that's properly controlled. Surgical management is indicated, and I already talked about this before, but I wanna remind you again. The reason we would do surgery is if a patient has greater than or equal to 5.5 centimeters on their aortic scan, right? Or it's gotten bigger and very quickly, greater than 0.5 centimeters in six months. Those are the primary reasons we would do that. The other one is that they're symptomatic. In other words, they're coming in with hemodynamic instability that are showing potential signs of rupture or really scary complications. In that scenario, we need to go to surgery. So it's usually elective under these scenarios or it's urgent or emergent because they're developing complications or they're in shock. And those would be the indications that I want you guys to think about. Again, we can do this with a graft or we can do this with this stent called the EVAR. All right, my friends, we covered aortic diseases. I hope that made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time. Thank you.